Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 Legal and Policy Strategies to Promote Mental Health, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law and the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. I'm Charles Strong, the Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. A quick note that both the presentation slides and video playback for this webinar will be available on our website shortly after the conclusion of today's event. We strongly encourage attendee participation and would love to hear from you, so feel free to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and send us your question. We'll be addressing the questions during the second half of today's event. Your moderator for today's webinar is Kayleen Claridge. Kayleen is the marketing and member manager here at the Network's National Office, and she'll be leading us through the rest of today's webinar. So, Kayleen, over to you. Thank you, Charles. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Jill Kruger serves as the director of the Network's Northern Region Office. Her current work involves climate adaptation and mitigation, the Farm Bill and Agricultural Policy, Rural Health, Oral Health, Literacy, and Mental Health Promotion. Jill, I'll turn it over to you. Afternoon, um, as, as the case may be, for wherever your location is, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we wanted to hold this webinar in May because May is Mental Health Month, and we'll be talking about some legal and policy strategies to promote mental health. Now, for those of you who may have a bit of a sinking feeling in your stomach or tension in your neck or shoulders or a little bit of tightness in your jaw because we're going to be talking about mental health during a pandemic for the next hour, I want to provide some good news. There is definitely cause for real concern and a need for thoughtful collective action to promote mental health, but we do have some effective legal strategies to discuss. So please, Take a few deep breaths or whatever will help you release tension and anxiety, and let's begin. We're going to provide an overview of mental health strategies um, in this short um, one-hour webinar and touch briefly on uh, the topics that you see listed on the slide. Now, after the webinar, as Charles mentioned, we will have a survey, and it would really be helpful, I'd appreciate um, a response on whether a deeper dive on any of these particular topics would be helpful in a future webinar. We do have some fact sheets and issue briefs underway on some of these topics as well, but it would be great to get a sense of what would be most helpful, um, most responsive to your needs and, and the initiatives that you're working on. So without further ado, um, I will just note um, Anthony Jorm is a psychology professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia, um, and he's one of the originators of mental health first aid. In 2012, he wrote, it is important to note that mental health literacy is not simply a matter of having knowledge, as might be conveyed in an abnormal psychology course. Rather, it is knowledge that is linked to the possibility of action to benefit one's own mental health or that of others. And I think that's our goal here today. So let's talk about some of the impacts of COVID um, on mental health. And I will say this, this presentation will be quite focused on the United States, but certainly COVID is a global phenomenon with similar impacts in, in some cases although some differences um, in other countries around the world, but we will be focusing on the United States in this discussion for the most part. So the, the most obvious um, cause of mental health impacts of the COVID pandemic um, are deaths and illness. Um, you know, the, the case count in, in the United States is headed toward 100,000 um, in the next week, two weeks, we don't know. But um, that's a lot of social circles that are impacted by grief. Um, those who get ill with COVID and then recover may have a very difficult recovery. 
with lots of challenges along the way. Um, those who get ill or those who are health care providers who have colleagues and friends who get ill and or die but do not become ill themselves may experience survivor guilt, as may any of us. Um, and certainly any of us may experience anxiety over the thought um, or the risk of becoming ill with COVID or the coronavirus. A uh, second big cause of mental health impacts is closures, closures of schools, businesses, workplaces, um, the, the stay home orders in, in many states across the country um, have caused a great deal of economic disruption, um, unemployment, anxiety. I saw a figure that the Fed chair, um, uh, Jerome Powell, found that about 40% uh, of people with um, incomes under $40,000 had lost their jobs as a result of the uh, pandemic and, and the closure orders. Um, major cause of anxiety, um, isolation. And, and at the same time, at the other end of the spectrum, lack of solitude. So people are feeling cut off, stuck in their own homes. Um, at the same time, <laughs> they're stuck in their own homes, um, you know, with, with potentially all of their family members, all of their roommates, housemates, whatever their living situation may be. Um, and they're not accustomed to become, becoming um, particularly parents, but but many others may not be accustomed to always having um, being in the company of those family members, and that can create many stresses um, as well, particularly in homes that previously were not safe, um, where domestic violence or child abuse was was present. Loss of freedom, um, people are chafing; they're they're feeling quarantine fatigue. I, I saw the term coined. Um, and, and online everything. There's, there's certainly fatigue associated with um, some of the online mechanisms that people have advanced to, to stay connected. And then one last major, there are certainly many, many other sources of, of mental health impacts, but I tried to, I've tried to identify some of the largest. One other major factor is those living in congregate living situations, whether they be nursing homes, jails, prisons, um, a variety of other congregate living situations, um, but particularly for our elders who may be in nursing homes or um, assisted living situations, uh, given their particular vulnerability, as we've learned, to coronavirus, that can create a lot of anxiety and intensified feelings of isolation as those facilities um, are largely closed uh, other than to staff members coming and going. Um, family members are unable to visit, um, and it raises lots of ethical questions about how we, as a society, will will address these these challenges. So those are some of the major mental health impacts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this webinar discussing those because we're all living these health impacts um, and experiencing them. And I, I will just one one sort of factual piece. Uh, Mental Health America for a number of years has had online screening tools on their website for a variety of mental health conditions. Um, they've noted that um, since the pandemic began, um, they've had a 70% uptick in people taking their screenings for depression and anxiety. Um, they reported at the beginning of May about 18,000 positive tests for depression and anxiety. Uh, that's about three weeks ago, and just anecdotally, I think uh, some people are experiencing that each week of this experience uh, in some ways can be harder than the last. So um, it would be interesting to see updated information from Mental Health America. I didn't um, uh, find that in my research for this presentation. But anyway, so that's that's just the broad sketch of what we're – the challenge we're facing. Um you know, and one of the things that's happened, I think, that's that's a great survival strategy is, is sidewalk chalk, um, something for children to do to express themselves, share messages of hope. Um, this, was, this one says, we are all in this together. Um, I will note that we need to be cautious that calls to unity don't obscure important differences. We are not all in the same boat, and we're not all having the same experience. That said people are experiencing a range of normal reactions to an abnormal situation, and that's, that bears repeating. Um, 
Now, this presentation is rooted in the conviction that mental health is more than the absence of mental illness, and this webinar is not focused on the treatment of mental illness. Um, there's different frameworks for presenting this uh, conceptualization. I like the dual continuum model described by C Professor Corey Keyes and others in the field of positive psychology. And the dual continuum demonstrates that mental health and mental illness can be measured as distinct variables. Now, Dr. Keyes says that those with poor mental health are languishing, and those with good mental health are flourishing. So that's the vertical axis. And you can have mental illness and still be flourishing. Now, what are the kinds of activities which contribute to flourishing? Well, they've been identified in the positive psychology research. They include interacting, helping others, playing, moving, physical activity, spiritual activity, learning something new. And wow, a lot of those have been dramatically impacted by the pandemic. You can see why so many are concerned about a possible second curve that will need to flatten of mental health impacts following the physical impacts. When you count up how many of these daily activities have been negatively affected or disrupted by the current pandemic. Now, we're going to talk in the rest of this webinar about some adaptations that can be made to still um, can be made, have been made on the fly, can be institutionalized and made given more structural support through law and policy. Um, but the fact remains that, that those changes have needed to be made um, you know, and, and we're looking to, to move from, from coping day to day to um, perhaps a more stable adaptation at a broader level. So here are some principles of mass trauma intervention that I find really helpful as a base to return to again and again. And this is coming out of a, a study, a review of the evidence, um, that's, that's endured since 2007. I, the, the folks in the field have found it to be reliable um, over time, and, and so that provides me some comfort. So those principles about how to intervene in a situation, you know, maybe many of us might say COVID, the COVID pandemic is unprecedented, but we have had our, our fair share of mass traumas in the United States and around the world and have had an opportunity to learn about the importance of promoting a sense of safety, promoting a calming, providing a, a calming presence, um, promoting a sense of self and collective efficacy, self-efficacy and collective ef efficacy. Um, really, really importantly in this current context, promoting connectedness and then promoting hope. I think those can provide five guiding lights for us as we seek to promote mental health during the COVID pandemic. And there are signs of hope, um, you know, and, and you all can probably come up with them from your own lives. I, I just heard the term social assistancing um, from the, the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. Um, this notion that even though we're, we're staying at home, for those who may be at home and unable to go out or afraid to go out to the grocery store or meet even their most basic needs, there's this notion that we can help others and thereby meet one of our basic needs for flourishing in our own mental health. Um, so I won't belabor all of these signs of hope, but they're really important and they're springing up and I think provide building blocks for us as we contemplate um, growth and moving toward stronger mental health. Uh, Mo Willems, who many many of you may have uh, known about, um, he was a, he's a children's book author and illustrator and, and had a position at the Kennedy Center um, and did lunchtime doodles. And he said, science is going to get us out of this, but art is going to get us through this. And, and we've seen that again. We've seen Lottie, Lady Gaga uh, uh, pulling musicians together at home together, songs of comfort from Yo-Yo Ma, uh, the Alvin Ailey da Dance Theater, um, releasing some of their most um, sought-after performances as well as holding online dance classes. So art really does play a role here, and as, as does science. Now, psychological first aid is probably 
one of the most important interventions here in the immediate um, unfolding trauma um, of the pandemic, as well as in the coming months. And, and you can see it. There was a, a story in the New York Times, I can't turn my brain off. PTSD and burnout threaten medical workers. And the really important need for first responders, for helpers, for those health care providers, including mental health care providers, teachers, parents, all of those supervisors, all of those who are guiding and helping others to take care of themselves, to manage their own stress, as well as have um, the competencies and skills to help others. So psychological first aid is an evidence-informed approach to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of those folks to support individuals and communities, including themselves. It's a universal intervention, but as I mentioned, has some particular applications and relevance. Now, the elements of psychological first aid are laid out on this slide. And it's really interesting to me, and I think important to note, that we it's connected with the real world circumstances. Practical assistance is a key component of psychological first aid. Thinking, you know, identifying current needs and concerns, working on problem solving, connection with social supports. So it's, n it's, it's not all in our heads. It's a really hands-on um, support because sometimes what can happen is people's problem solving skills under stress can be diminished. So psychological first aid calls on, on um, you know, supporters to help those folks recover and reaccess their prefrontal cortex for problem-solving purposes. Now, what, is, what does law and policy have to do with psychological first aid? Well, there's, there's some, there is some relevance here. Um, the CDC has funded preparedness and emergency response learning centers at schools of public health, and many of those schools of public health developed trainings in psychological first aid, some of which are still available online from the University of Minnesota, from a partnership between the University of Albany and SUNY New Paltz in New York from the University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and, and others. Um, it's, it's worth noting, though, the importance of sustaining that funding. One of the things we're talking about is the broader need for support for the public infrastructure, um, not just during an emergency, but that we need the funding um, to, to have these tools at the ready when an emergency occurs. And, I'm thankful that, that we had this, this um, PERLC, <laughs> it's a difficult acronym, um, in place. So we've got these tools already to some extent at the ready. Um, we know that uh, those who have cooperative agreements under the Public Health Emergency Preparedness, FEP, and Hospital Preparedness Program um, frequently have uh, delivery of psychological first aid um, as one of their deliverables under the cooperative agreement. That institutionalizes the importance of delivering this training before the event of a disaster. Now, it's, it's, that's not to say there won't be a need to offer that training again now um, or in the future to, to brush up those skills, to adapt that training to particular challenges of a particular event, such as the COVID pandemic, but having that all in place is part of what we're talking about in terms of law and policy and part of, you know, outcomes of lessons learned from, from previous events, whether it's 9-11 or Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Harvey or the wildfires in California, uh, whatever the case may be. Now, one of those, those PERC grants, um, the one at um, University of Albany and, and SUNY New Paltz in New York, one of their folks the focus, a part, part of the focus of their grant was on policy. And so, and I have a citation to an article that was published in AJPH in 2018. They worked with local health departments and hospital and healthcare systems to develop policies, um, you know, institutionalizing their psychological first aid training. Um, so I invite you to check out that AJPH article and um, 
you know, if you have questions about some of those policies, just uh, feel free to follow up in the Q&A or follow up with me after the webinar. Um, the National Trial, uh, excuse me, National Child Traumatic Stress Network um, has been funded um, through a, ver a variety of, of funding mechanisms and appropriations and um, federal acts. Um, most recently, the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, so the National Tri Child Traumatic Stress Network also has provided written materials on um, providing training for psychological first aid as well as um, again, cooperative agreements and other support um, funded through through, through SAMHSA um, for um, assisting children through um, recovery um, from trauma such as the COVID pandemic. So those are just some examples. Um, it can sometimes seem like, well, there's this is just a program, right? But but usually a program needs law and policy behind it to make it happen, to have it in place when it's needed. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, there are a variety of similar strategies to psychological first aid. Uh, there's stress management training. Um, I invite you to check out, in the next slide we'll have a little more information. The San Francisco Health Department has made a commitment to being becoming a trauma-informed um, or even beyond trauma-informed workplace. Um, and that may provide a model for, for health departments seeking to integrate some of these learnings into across all of the work of the health department. Um, we're seeing a lot of exhaustion among first responders um, and difficulty sleeping even when they're off the clock. So, you know, to the extent that limitations on work hours and, and shifts have been relaxed, whether it's for health care providers or delivery drivers, um, whatever the case may be, it may be a time to, to revisit those and see, you know, if, if this is a marathon and not a sprint, how do we help those first responders take care of themselves? I saw um, Carleton College here in Minnesota, where I'm based, has a sleep coaching program for its students. Now, that's not a COVID adaptation, but it may be something for employers to think about if, if they're finding a lot of their employees are, are reporting difficulty sleeping, and we're certainly seeing that both anecdotally and in the data. Um, employers can advise and remind their employees to the extent they have employee assistance programs. Now, by, my background um, is as an attorney in uh, farm law, agricultural law, and so I just mentioned a couple of examples from that context. In the Farm Bill, there was authorization for a farm and ranch stress assistance network. And um, in Minnesota and many other states, there's a program called Farmer Lender Mediation, which was adapted um, back in the 1980s, partially as a response to a wave of, of suicides in the farming community as a response to economic distress. And so farmer-lender mediation can, in fact, be a tool to alleviate um, the mental health impacts of financial distress. Now, those are just two examples from a sector that I'm familiar with. There may be other examples in, in other sectors. So I mentioned the San Francisco Public Health Department. Here's a graphic um, talking about sort of the different stages that they've gone through and other similar organizations may go through um, incorporating an understanding of trauma and and helping that having that knowledge change how they approach the work of promoting public health. So that is a framework that may be valuable to, to some of you on the call. The Crisis Counseling Program is... Um, a program that, interestingly, I just mentioned that my background is in agricultural law. So one of the things I did in the first decade of my legal practice was um, we had various editions of a farmer's guide to disaster assistance. Now, so what I know from that background, my experience of the Stafford Act, of the Stafford Act, the Federal Stafford Act, which is a law that provides for emergency response at the federal level, often through freeing up federal funding and, and legal authorities. So my experience as an agricultural lawyer was in response to natural disaster. And so I was familiar from it with the crisis counseling program from that context. Um, but of course, in public health, the Stafford Act is usually invoked um, through an emergency declaration or a public health emergency declaration rather than a major disaster declaration. It's virtually unprecedented 
for the president to declare not just a, an emergency or a public health emergency in response to a disease outbreak or a pandemic, but to also declare a major disaster declaration. And by declaring a major disaster, um, the president opened up um, the crisis counseling program. Its full name is the Crisis Counseling Assistance and Training Program. And so there's a presidential memo, not quite a presidential executive order, but a presidential memo discussing that crisis counseling program um, that was issued at the end of April that discusses how that funding will be, um, what funding is uh, available and how it will be allocated among the various states, in part based upon the requests for a major disaster declaration that were submitted by the individual states. Um, there's some background on the types of counseling um, provided by the crisis counseling program. It is individual crisis counseling, so I wouldn't, it should be distinguished, or individual or group crisis counseling, as distinguished from mental health treatment, perhaps for those who may have had pre-existing mental health conditions. But it is a program that will be um, on board, coming on board in, in many states, um, and it's an important intervention to be aware of. Okay, so I mentioned toward the top of the hour that we are all in this together, but we are not all having the same experience. And many of us in public health are very familiar with the social determinants of mental health. And even as we look at the paradigm for psychological first aid, there was a great emphasis on the practical circumstances, addressing the practical challenges faced in the midst of a disaster or a pandemic, such as we're experiencing. And there's a reason for that, because these situations disrupt those, um, those determinants of health, those practical conditions that surround our lives. Um, certainly, people who have already experienced high numbers of adverse childhood experiences may experience the pandemic differently from those who have not. Um, in 2018, the Congress passed a resolution, so not legally binding, but an important recognition of the importance of addressing adverse childhood experiences. And I commend that resolution to you because it, it cites examples from across the United States, and they're local examples, state examples, tribal examples of how communities are coming together to address trauma and adverse childhood experiences. So not a COVID-specific intervention, but one that could become available to activate. And in many places, already these interventions are doing incredible work to help people weather the challenges of this pandemic. Um, we are not experiencing this pandemic the same based on our, our race and ethnicity. Um, the New York City Commission on Human Rights has formed a COVID-19 response team. They've um, fielded hundreds of um, complaints about harassment and discrimination. And that's a really important role for public health to be aware of, to be taking on harassment, discrimination, hate crimes, bigotry, um, directly or affirmatively sending messages um, to, to counter those, those tendencies, the, the, the desire to look for a scapegoat or for someone to blame. Racial disparities in healthcare um, is something that one of my colleagues in the network has examined, and you can look at, you can review her issue brief. It's, it's online on the network's website. Um, employment disparities. As, as I mentioned, many higher, the, the Federal Reserve Chair had noted that unemployment, the unemployment impacts of the pandemic are clustered or concentrated lower, not, not exclusively, but lower on the, the income spectrum. Those of higher incomes have been more able to seamlessly, well, maybe not so seamlessly, but to be able to work remotely from home. And so those, that unemployment aspect then fuels worries about paying one's rent, one's mortgage. And again, the network has had you know, a webinar and has other resources on our website. I commend you to, to review those. Um, access to the outdoors and nature. There's, 
really compelling research um, out there. The, the Children and Nature Network is one place that has a resource research library of articles addressing mental health impacts of access to nature. Um, and that's not available um, the same in every zip code. Um, it's a social determinant of health. And there are law and policy interventions that we can make to expand access to nature and try and do so equitably. For example, in, in Minneapolis, um, the city and the park board have closed um, a number, I think the last count I saw was perhaps 18 miles, maybe it's more by now, of streets and near um, parks, near lakes, um, places where it would be pleasant to walk, but the demand was too high. They had to close the streets to allow for proper social distancing, and that's a, an intervention. It's not cost-free, but, but there is precedent out there um, to address one of those social determinants of health. Okay, access to care and telemental health. So here's a quote from Ben Miller at the Wellbeing Trust, which is a national mental health foundation, um, in an article titled, um, soberingly, The Coming Mental Health Crisis. And um, he said, before the COVID-19 crisis, America's infrastructure for mental health and addiction services was fragmented, overburdened, and underfunded. And that all of those qualities are only exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, you know, and, and I could expand on, on what Dr. Miller has said. There's a lack of integration with primary care. Um, a decade after the Affordable Care Act, mental health parity in terms of coverage of, under private insurance for um, mental health considerations um, at the same level for insurance providers who cover physical illness is still more aspirational than realized. Um, there are provider shortages, particularly in rural communities, and the list goes on. Now, my presentation doesn't have a great deal of discussion about the relief bills um, that have been passed by Congress to address the COVID pandemic. And mental health has been not been a major focus of those bills to date. Um, the Federal CARES Act had $425 million of funding directed toward mental health um, in a variety of, of smaller buckets. And $425 million is, is not um, you know, insignificant, but it, it may not be commensurate with the need um, and is not commensurate, I would argue, with, with the responses to, to some of the other aspects of the pandemic. Um, that $425 million, um, $250 million of it is directed to um, uh, certified CCBHCs, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics, which are one of the testing grounds for having greater integration between um, particularly behavioral health and primary care. Um, but CCBHCs are not present in every state. I think at last count they were present um, you know, in over 30 states, but not all 50 states. Um, an important intervention, but, but, it, but again, not, not national, um, not, not available in every state. Um, there were $50 million for um, suicide prevention, um, $100 million for various other emergency response grants. Um, there were some amendments to 42 CFR Part 2 for those um, on the call who are familiar with, with data laws. Um, addressing, again, particularly behavioral health considerations um, and loosening some of the requirements of those regulations to allow for, with patient consent, um, greater sharing of, of patient records. So there have been some efforts recently, um, you know, particularly in the CARES Act, to address um, access to care. But I would argue and I don't think this is controversial, that much more will be needed. Now, one of the success stories um, at the federal level and the state level, I think, is the expansion in, in the use of telehealth. And for the purposes of this presentation, of course, we're focused on telemental health um, or telehealth for mental health services. But the, many of the issues are the same for, for most or same or similar for most aspects of um, for mental health and physical health. So the, the challenges that have served as barriers to wider adoption of telehealth uh, 
for the last number of years, our data privacy and security, reimbursement, licensure across straight state lines where a provider, and because it's it's you know it's virtual, you know arguably a provider and um, their patient or client you know could be in opposite ends of the country. Um, but then there are legal questions about portability of licensure. So in the last several months, at both the federal and state level, a great deal has been done to address all of those challenges. So, for example, um, OCR, um, the Office of Civil Rights within the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, issued guidance um, relaxing requirements um, related to the, the security of platforms for providing telehealth. Um, issued guidance about um, broadening um, geographic restrictions and um, clarifying reimbursement uh, under Medicare. Um, many states have, have also issued guidance, and so we've ex seen um, an explosion in the use of telehealth as um, mental health providers seek to continue to provide services to their clients, but to protect both their own and their clients' safety. Now, how does this continue after the pandemic? Will all of this sort of evaporate? It seems hard to put the genie back in the bottle, but we will need an enduring legal infrastructure that is not cobbled together during an emergency. Now, one piece that was um, gathering momentum prior to the pandemic is the Psychology Interjurisdictional Compact, and that's an agreement among states. Um, it's, it's more contractual um, to recognize licensure and, and figure out how to resolve if there are perhaps uh, malpractice claims or the like or differences in, the, in state laws across state lines, how will those be resolved? And the psychology interjurisdictional impact, excuse me, um, just um, secured the minimum number of states. Um, I don't have that number right in front of me, but I believe it was seven um, last year. Um, and, and there may be a growth in interest among many other states following this pandemic experience. Another key piece that isn't so much about the legal infrastructure, it's, it's about the physical in infrastructure, but we will need law and policy to support the expansion of that physical infrastructure, is broadband access. And that's something um, some of my network colleagues, um, Betsy Lawton and Matt Swinburne, have been working on. And you can look forward to a, a webinar in the coming um, months uh, about um, how do we expand broadband access to make things like telehealth and distance learning accessible and equitable, and that will require law and policy. Um, I will commend to you a great resource on all issues telehealth, the Center for Connected Health Policy. Okay, school mental health. Um, the largest grouping of questions that we received in advance of the webinar related to school mental health. So we will spend a fair amount of time. Um, we've got some good examples here that I think, um, that I hope will, will be useful. So again, we're not starting, <laughs> we're not having to cobble everything together during this pandemic. Um, you know, there's, there's the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, or CASEL, just celebrated um, last fall, and, and my colleague Betsy Lawton and I were, were at their, their conference last fall, um, a milestone anniversary, I believe it was 20 years. Um, I hope that's right. Um, if I'm not, my apologies to Castle, but um, on their work on promoting social and emotional learning as a companion to academic learning. And they've developed a framework of five competencies that um, support academic learning and support um, public health so broadly. I'm, I'm just a cheerleader for SEL because the outcome, um, the impacts in terms of outcomes, and I wrote a blog post about this, I think, last fall, um, in terms of, you know, everything from substance, tobacco, and alcohol use to risky driving behavior to, um, you know, risky sexual behavior. SEL is an intervention that can be helpful because it supports um, people's self, the student's self-awareness, their self-management, their responsible decision-making, uh, their relationship skills, and their social awareness. So all of those skills together, you know, particularly the responsible decision-making, but all of them in combination, um, I, I think are, are very helpful. Um, so want folks to be aware of that intervention. Now, one of the things that's come out of that SEL movement, Mark Brackett is a board member, 
at Castle, and he has a new book out um, that they gave away copies of at the conference. In fact, Permission to Feel, and um, basically recognizing the need for a robust vocabulary to describe our emotions and to become emotion scientists. So um, he uses a framework called RULER uh, to assist students and adults to recognize, understand, label, express appropriately, and regulate effectively their emotions. And I, I can attest that uh, emotion regulation in, in times of acute stress um, and unfamiliar working environments and um, you know, five-year-old coworkers, it's a it's a new challenge. And having support in the skills to to do that successfully and in a way that um, supports oneself and the the ones around you is is really valuable. And that can be adopted at a systems level. Um, so, for example, um, Bra uh, Mark Brackett is based at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. They're working on that rural, ruler model. Um, with schools across the nation, but in particularly working with schools throughout Connecticut at um, creating those systems-level policies to support these kinds of educational approaches. And you might be saying, well, that's all very well. Um, when kids are in the schools, what do we do now when they're not? Um, and so some of those tools um, are starting to become available so we don't all have to reinvent the wheel. So the Austin um, School District in Texas has been part of a collaborating districts initiative with CASEL um, for the last number of years. And so um, they've posted a number of resources um, addressing social and emotional learning um, at home. And there are resources for kids, but also for teachers and parents and caregivers. Um, and so to have these kinds of supports available um, if you're at a different school district that, um, you know, you may not have to reinvent the wheel. So I invite you to check this out. Um, similarly, the state of New York in, in the last couple of years adopted a law to incorporate, to require schools to incorporate mental health in their health education courses. And a, a couple of other states, um, including Virginia, have adopted similar laws. But New York State was the first, um, and they have a school mental health resource training center, um, which has adopted um, a page on school mental health during social distancing. So again, a source, a place to look for resources that might um, you might adapt to your own particular community context. But these resources are made possible in part by the fact that New York already had this law in place, already had a school mental health resource training center in place um, at a system, systematic level. So again, law can be a facilitator and, and um, help us get through this, this pandemic, um, as, as Mo Willems said. Okay, let's see. I do wanna make sure we have plenty of time for question and answer, so I'll um, keep cranking through here. Um, we've already talked about trauma-informed approaches. For people who might be interested in, in trauma-informed schools, one good place to start is the movie Paper Tigers about the experience in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, Florida has um, had some experience in the last couple of years implementing um, essentially a required training in mental health first aid that's distinguished from psychological first aid um, but again, it's about getting the knowledge and skills out to treat, uh, excuse me, out to teachers. So that is a, an important mental health intervention in schools. One of the things I've, I've seen educators concerned about is access to books. Um, we know that for um, kids in low-income communities, um, the summer slide is is accounts for much of the opportunity and achievement gap um, that we see across income levels and across racial and ethnicity, race and ethnicity. And so um, I've been doing some, some research on this, um, on strategies, and, and of course books can also be really important to mental health more directly in, in terms of providing an escape, providing a closeness and a connection with a parent or caregiver, an opportunity. Um, for that closeness or connection, or a trusted adult. Um, lots of schools and libraries are doing online story times where a child can 
experience that connection at least virtually with a trusted adult. Um, you know, and books can be a way to develop empathy and insight into others' experiences, and as well as process difficult situations. So I saw a, a column recently by Donald and Miller in School Library Journal discussing how communities are, are addressing this access to book challenge. Um, she talked about little free libraries. Now I know there may be some question, it's not a policy approach, it's more of a DIY approach, and there may be concerns about, you know, in if a little free library is in a high traffic area, is that actually compounding the risk of transmission of the virus? So I'm not here to commend or recommend the use of little free libraries, but it is something that was discussed in the School Library Journal article. But another idea that, that many communities were identified, or at least some communities were identified as, as experimenting with, were um, most communities are um, implementing food distribution for kids who are home from school. And so some communities have paired book distributions with that food distribution. So there's already um, a lot of that infrastructure in place, so it's just a matter of, not just a matter, but um, it takes advantage of that um, to also distribute books. One other intervention that has been in place over the last couple of years on, at varying levels was called the Book Rich Environment. It was a public-private partnership between the U.S. Department of Education, the National Book Foundation, um, a number of library systems across the country, and it was really aimed at increasing the access of children in public housing to to books, and that again was the book rich environment. And, and there may be opportunities to expand that approach, um, you know, as we as we head into summer or revisit that approach. The um, the Emory Global Health Institute had a contest for books about to help children understand the coronavirus. Um, uh, I, I should preface that by saying in late February, the National Public Radio, um, National Public Radio did a comic, created a comic um, for kids about understanding the, the new coronavirus and the importance of social stories to help people, to help children especially understand what is going on around them is, is really vital. So I, I just lift up that example um, and even the headline, the press release from Emory talks about helping children children understand both the facts and the emotions surrounding the pandemic. Suicide prevention is our next topic. Okay. Um, so the Wellbeing Trust has worked with the, has worked with the, um, the Robert Graham Center um, to, to do some analysis um, of possible deaths of despair related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, folks in the working previously in the area of mental health will be familiar with that term of deaths of despair that where, um, you know, suicide and opioid use were skyrocketing, particularly in rural communities, um, including about what among white middle-aged men and and it, the, the term deaths of despair was coined. It certainly wasn't limited to white middle-aged men, but it was a, uh, at the time seen as an anomaly. And um, the, the term is, has gained traction. Um, in any case, the Wellbeing Trust has really identified a significant potential for deaths of despair um, linked with COVID-19. They're projecting perhaps as high as 75,000 um, lives lost due to suicide. And so this is this is um a warning sign it's it's they're showing up a little bit in some of the screening that mental health america does as well so let's let's talk about that um one intervention that again was already underway um and in, in fact is before the congress sent the senate has passed a bipartisan bill that seeks to make the national suicide prevention hotline a three digit number there have been reports and analysis um concluding that having a more easily memorized or memorable number um, would likely increase use, and we know that hotlines, suicide hotlines are an effective intervention. Um, so at this point, the last I checked, I didn't get a chance to check this morning, um, but that's, that's on its way through the Congress, and then if, if signed by the President, um, that legislation would allow an individual seeking help to dial 988 and be directed to the hotline. The, the old number would still work as well. But there are many other important interventions 
Um, the, the Garrett Lee Smith, I mentioned that the CARES Act did have additional funding for suicide prevention. The Garrett Lee Smith Act is, is one um, mechanism by which the federal government can get funds out to the states, tribes, and other, other governmental entities for suicide prevention activities. And the evidence base for these interventions is, is quite solid and compelling. So um, those of you working in suicide prevention already, um, your work will be more needed than ever, and we will need, I think, more of it. I think that is um, an opportunity for us to use and expand upon an already evidence-based um, effective strategy. Um, extreme risk protective protection orders, um, given the connection between the evidence base, the evidence of the connection between ready access to guns and suicide, we can't let red flags become a partisan issue. Um, there have been very compelling results in states as dissimilar as Connecticut and Indiana. And so in the shadow of what has already been identified as an epidemic of deaths of despair in rural communities, we need to discuss that evidence in culturally sensitive ways. Um, there are lots of other emerging approaches to address suicide prevention, um, too many to, to discuss right now, um, except uh, professional development for mental health and healthcare providers is certainly one emerging trend in the states. Now we talk about post-traumatic stress, but I wanted to close with a, a brief discussion of post-traumatic growth. Um, certainly one of the things we'll need to do to, to support any law and policy interventions is to do our best with policy surveillance related to mental health. And fortunately, again, that work was already underway pre-pandemic. CSTE has been advancing mental health and behavioral health indicators. That will help support and inform our legal and policy strategies. We have a baseline of understanding of you know, the factors that support mental health, and that's the kind of things we've been talking about. Reducing the sources of stress at the practical level, supporting responsive relationships, strengthening core life skills. You know, certainly there's, there's um, incredible evidence about the importance of preschool as a place where children can learn social emotional learning skills and um, importantly increase equitable um, exposure to those skills and to the skills needed for um, kindergarten readiness. Um, one thing I touched on the importance of access to nature, um, green schoolyards may provide an opportunity to meet a lot of our of our needs, a lot of co-benefits in terms of job creation, in terms of climate adaptation, getting rid of the blacktop. Um, the, the Children in Nature Network has, has done the analysis and school districts are often among the largest landowners in many municipalities and particularly lar larger urban areas. And so converting some of that blacktop to um, a more natural service can provide benefits in terms of carbon sequestration, absorption of storm waters, um, as well as stress relief for children. And it may, uh, there isn't research about this yet, but it may also be a resource for um, supporting social distancing. So I just did want to lift that up as an opportunity for um, what I'm going to call um, post-traumatic growth. So it can take a lot of effort to get strategies that are just right. Um, but we, we need to connect with each other. Um, in Minnesota, we have a mental health um, and well-being um, learning collective that's been really important in terms of offering webinars and um, an online base camp. I encourage other states and regions to consider similar approaches for exchanging ideas about promoting mental health. Um, and then I'll let Brene Brown have the last word before we transition to question and answer. Um, Brene Brown has said, this pandemic experience is a massive experiment in collective vulnerability. We can be our worst selves when we're afraid or our very best, bravest selves. So let's choose awkward, brave, and kind, and let's choose each other. And I'll hand it over to you, Kayleen. Great. Thank you, Jill. We'll get started right away with the Q&A. How are states using federal CARES Act and other stimulus funding to provide COVID-19 related mental health services, including via telehealth? Okay, well, I touched on that to some extent in the presentation. Um, for those states that have um, CCBHC, Certified um, Community Behavioral Health Clinics, that is an opportunity to expand those services. 
um, and, and um, provide more integrated mental, um, behavioral, and physical health care. Um, there's additional resources for suicide prevention and, and other emergency response. Um, but yeah, there's been a dramatic shift to telehealth, um, and states have adopted laws to facilitate reimbursement for, for mental health services offered by a telehealth, um, to facilitate um, access to to platform, you know, to appropriate um, technological platforms. Um, but certainly, there's there's more work to be done to get us out of an emergency response to a more sustainable um, response. To the extent that um, states want to continue to use telehealth, it may be acceptable, for example, to relax privacy and security standards um, in an emergency situation. But there may be better long-term solutions that we can devise um, to to balance those privacy considerations with with the need to expand access to care. How has the Families First Corona, Coronavirus Response Act been promoted by the federal government to ensure that the most vulnerable populations understand the law and their rights under the law? Well, I think um, there's been some effort to use a lot of the traditional methods to, you know, we, we've got experience, experience you know, getting EEOC messages out there. Um, I know that um, legal assistance programs, legal services programs, and medical legal partnerships are in conversation about how to ensure that those vulnerable populations do have access, um, both knowledge of their rights and access and the ability to appeal where they believe that they've been denied their rights. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that the Stafford Act um, because there is a major disaster declaration for this public health um, situation, the, the Stafford Act has freed up, we, the president has freed up under the Stafford Act, crisis, the crisis counseling program. Also under the Stafford Act, an available authority that to my knowledge has not yet been activated is the disaster legal services program. And that's a program that I saw very successful in my work as an agricultural lawyer um, it utilizes, it's a partnership with the American Bar Association um, and particularly their Young Lawyers Division where um, <laughs> new lawyers provide um, essentially pro bono, free legal assistance to people affected, um, you know, and historically the context is by natural disaster to address some of their pressing practical needs. Now, the American Bar Association has posted a wealth of resources up on their website um, in terms of, and, and it's for employers, it's for a variety of stakeholders, but including individuals. Um, but to my knowledge, that disaster legal services program has not itself been activated, which is another great, great resource. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Is psychological first aid being applied to healthcare workers currently? Well, I think it's pro it's difficult to answer that question at a at a blanket level. Um, um, gosh, how can I answer that helpfully in in a short amount of time? I mean, certainly, I, I mentioned the the partnership in New York, where they certainly have had experience dating back to 9/11 and Hurricane Sandy and a variety of other situations. Um, you know, there the you know, because of the partnership under the CDC grant, um, the, the PROC grant, they had worked um, at University of Albany and, and SUNY New Paltz with a number of healthcare systems on establishing policies around psychological first aid. So that's one example that I, that I can point to, and, and if the questioner is interested, we could probably track down um, examples of some of those policies. But um, it's difficult to generalize across the country in terms of what's what's happening, although that might be a question for further research to just to lift up some of those examples where that is being done and the policies that are being used to support and institutionalize that. Thank you, Jill. I'll turn it over to Charles for a closing remark. Thanks, Kayleen, uh, and thank you again, Jill, for presenting today. Um, I learned a lot, and I'm sure our attendees did as well. So just a few final notes to everyone um, in today's event. If you submitted a question that did not get 
addressed during the Q&A session, don't worry. Um, we'll be reaching out to you to ensure your questions get answered. And um, also all attendees will be receiving an email from the network with the video playback of this webinar, as well as a link to our brief webinar survey. The survey takes just one minute to fill out and it provides us with some really great insights, um, especially in regards to what topics you might be interested in for future webinars. You'll also be receiving an email from ASLME with information on how to apply for CLE credits for this event. Join us next Thursday for a webinar on COVID-19 and reopening economies where presenters will cover emerging constitutional and other legal and policy challenges to state and local efforts to reopen their economies. Learn more about that webinar and view the network's collection of resources on the pandemic at networkforphl.org slash COVID-19. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.